really? I'm not afraid. That's just what happens when you have bugs. I can't remember when I was in drawing. I was drawing before I was writing. I think a lot of kids do, though. When you're a kid, you may not be articulating this to yourself as you're doing it, but you start to get a sense of who you are. I always drew, and it was always something that I liked to do, and it was always something from when I was little that it would be like, well, that's a nice drawing. So you get a sort of sense, and then it makes you want to do it more, you know? I know when I was a kid, seeing stuff that made me laugh, and that if I could make other people laugh, so it's like really important for me. I remember being about four years old and discovering the word anxiety, which I thought was pronounced anxiety. And I knew what it was, you know, because I knew I had a lot of it. And sometimes, like, things that you worry about, then later they might seem funny. Ho, 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 ho. That was such a silly thought I was having about the bathtub falling through the floor. Um, but at the time, you know, maybe I was, like, quite in a getting into quite a panic about it. I was not a happy-go-lucky kid, and I think uh, things that made me laugh were really great, you know. My parents used to go up to Cornell University in Ithaca with a group of other Brooklyn school teachers. There was a browsing library, and there was one section of it, and I still remember it was all cartoon books, and that's where I saw Charles Adams' work, and I was obsessed with it because it really made me laugh. Cartoons, just in general, I love that medium. I just love that medium. I don't think I ever thought about career. I just thought, this is all I can do. It never even occurred to me that I would ever be able to do anything else. Um, I didn't want to work in a school. Cash registers frightened me. I was not good at listening to people's instructions and say, do this, do this, do this. And be like, what? What did you say? The only thing I thought I could really do was work by myself and draw. I came out of school and I was living in my parents' apartment and drawing and uh, I did not think I was going to be able to make a living as a cartoonist. I thought maybe I would be an illustrator and I was a terrible illustrator. And then at some point I just decided I'm going to try the cartoons. And I was very surprised because that's when I started to get work. So I was doing some stuff for The Voice, I was doing some stuff for the National Lampoon, and in April of 1978 I brought a portfolio of cartoons to The New Yorker, uh, not thinking for a minute that I would sell a cartoon there because my cartoons really didn't look like anything in the magazine. I took pretty much everything I had, which was about 60 drawings, and I put them in a portfolio and with my little card, you know, and I came back to pick it up the next week, and there was a note from the cartoon editor, and uh, he said to start coming back every week. So I did. Sometimes when I'm doodling, it's like I'll just like make up some little shape, or I'll make up a, like lists of names of people. They make me laugh, you know, the sound of a certain word, or a shape, like some shape will make me laugh. It's not like a joke, it's just like this little abstract thing, and it'll just like... <clears throat> and so that was the one that they took, and I guess when they ran it, a lot of people were kind of upset, um, which I didn't know. But Lee told me later that one of the older cartoonists had asked him whether he owed my family money. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm glad I didn't know at the time. I've never thought of a philosophy <laughs> of cartooning. I, when I'm drawing, I'm thinking, like, what do I think is funny? You know, what is making me laugh? What's sort of getting to me? Um, I jot things down, but sometimes when I sit at my desk to draw it, it's, they're just terrible, and I think, boy, oh boy, I'll never have another funny idea. This is, I mean, I've been asked like about, like, do you ever have writer's block, and I think I have it all the time. I mean, I just think, you do it anyway, you know? The New Yorker is probably the most structured part of my schedule. Tuesday evening is my deadline for them when I have to get together a group of sketches from which they'll select maybe one, maybe none. Um, I usually turn in around six or eight uh, drawings a week. So Monday and Tuesday are my most like hermetically sealed days. 
you know, where I really pretty much lock myself away and try to not have any distractions and really just sit and doodle and think and draw and try to come up with the sketches. And the rest of the week I'm working on um, books, you know, whatever projects I'm working on. Oh, yes, yes, the birds. Wow. <laughs> the Marco book is totally an outgrowth of the conversations I used to have with my, with my kids. Um, Marco was this blue streak lorry that we had, wonderful bird, the red bird. And uh, I used to think of him as a little boy in a bird costume. And I would have these conversations with my kids. I'm going to say, I'm very angry. I can't believe, I can't believe this. We need to talk about something. And he just looked at me and said, and, you know, sometimes I would like just stall it out. Like just as sometimes I get them a little frightened. Like maybe I did mean something. Like what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? And I, and like they'd say, like, is it about the birds? No. And I'd like draw it out, draw it out. And finally when I felt like I had sort of like sparked a little like spark of fear a little bit, picture Marco in a deep sea diving helmet. And in the front of the helmet is a thing that accommodates his beak because, you know, so that book was totally inspired by a lot of picturing Marco in different scenarios. Some of my cartoons, I think of them as sort of more straightforward. They're cartoons, you know, that take place in cartoon land. But I also submit in these cartoons things that happen to me in my life that are sort of funny, like an odd conversation. There were conversations I'd had with my parents that I had no idea they would be in a book. I was just submitting them to The New Yorker, like when I visited my mother, and it's like this tattered, burned, patched oven mitt. Like, who patches an oven mitt? I realized that this is like a material from a skirt that I made in seventh grade. There were at least a dozen, more than that, cartoons in there that I had done just as part of my weekly batch. My mother, the stories at the end, some of them were sort of hilarious, but they were also heartbreaking because they were not her. You know, when she started telling me about how my father died before I was born, and I'm like, uh, no, I don't think so. Dad just died two years ago, and like, nope, that's how it happened, and I should know. And she was adamant about it. So there were funny things, and sometimes at the same time, you know, where it's just terrible, you know. It was just something that was such an interesting whole topic to me. Just wanting to give more of a sense of what the experience was like and what my parents were like and how they talked. It was about that. It was about not wanting to forget and also having a feeling that there was a story there. Even though it doesn't always paint this idolizing picture of my parents, I'm still very grateful to them, and I didn't want to forget them. I didn't want to forget how they talked. I didn't want to forget who they were, and I feel like I was able to capture it. So I felt good about the book, and for other people to feel that it meant something to them, I'm very happy about that. Yeah, that's my mommy's necklace. Hi, baby bird! I've been extraordinarily lucky and I keep waiting for you know the rug to be pulled out from under I constantly feel that at some point somebody's gonna realize that they made a terrible mistake and you know it's all going to you know disappear you know I do what I can with the skills that I have and I'm just gonna keep going because this is what I do Bob Mankoff told me that when he told his mother that he wanted to be a cartoonist. She said, why do you want to be a cartoonist? They already have people who do that. So, <laughs> so yeah, exactly, exactly.